Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, and welcome to the NFSN Trending Topics webinar, Engaging Farmers in Farm to School. We're going to give about one more minute to let people hop on, and then we will get started. Hello and welcome everyone to today's webinar. We will be focusing on engaging farmers in farm to school. Before we get started, a few housekeeping reminders. This webinar will be recorded and archived for future viewing in the National Farm to School Network resource database. You will also receive a link to access the recording in a follow-up email and links to the resources shared by our speakers today. All attendees are in listen-only mode. As questions arise, please feel free to enter those into the question box on your control panel. We will have plenty of time for questions and answers for our panelists at the end of the session. Also, this webinar is one hour and 15 minutes, 15 minutes longer than our usual webinars because we have so many wonderful presenters on such an important topic. And so please stick around for the extra 15 minutes so we can hear as many questions and answers as possible. My name is Hannah McCandless, NFSN's Network and Partnerships Fellow, and with me is Lacey Stevens, NFSN Program Manager, and we will be facilitating the webinar today. NFSN's Trending Topics webinars are monthly webinars open to the public aimed at highlighting trends, best practices, and stories of farm to school and ECE successes from our partners across the country. Today we, we will briefly introduce you to the National Farm to School Network for those of you joining us for the first time and share some information about upcoming National Farm to School events. We will then hear from our outstanding lineup of speakers. And again, there will be ample time for questions at the end of the webinar. So as questions arise, please do put them in the box in, in the questions box and we will get to them as quickly as we can. As you can see from this visual, the National Farm to School Network is truly built on a network model a network of organizations and individuals across the country working toward advancing farm to school and ECE. The National Farm to School Network is an information advocacy and networking hub for communities working to bring local food sourcing, school gardens and food and agriculture education into schools and early care and education settings. Through our network, we're able to connect people to resources, people to policy and people to people. Make sure to tune in for our next Trending Topics webinar in April, Family Engagement Through uh, Early Care and Education. Um, it will be on Thursday, April 5th uh, at 2 p.m. Eastern, and that is the link. You will also receive the link to register for this webinar in a follow-up email. Uh, the Farm to Cafeteria Conference is coming up on April 25th through 27th, and we hope to see you there. Registration is now open with early bird registration closing on March 9th and general registration closing on April 9th. And now we're going to hear from Lacey. 
Great, thanks, Hannah. I just want to set the stage a little bit for our presenters to talk about this great opportunity they have with engaging farmers in farm to school. Many of you are familiar with the core elements of farm to school, the procurement, the education, and the gardening that come together for benefits for children, farmers, and communities. And when we talk about engaging farmers, it's a really natural starting point to think about how we can engage farmers through that procurement piece. But I also want to think about, and we'll hear from our presenters, about these abundant opportunities that we have to engage farmers in all of these elements. Inviting producers into the classroom and getting students out into farms, orchards, and ranches. Of course, helps build that understanding and connection to how food grows and where it comes from, and that connection to our local community food system. And of course, as the experts in food production, some farmers might even be willing to provide support and recommendations in the garden. So as children find that joy in gardening and see the important role that farmers and producers play in their community, perhaps they may even see themselves as a farmer in the future. Next slide, please, Hannah. When we think about what we call this triple win of farm to school, with kids winning, farmers winning, and communities winning, of course, we see farmers as this important piece um, of that benefits and opportunities of farm to school. Many farmers see an increase in market opportunities with new and consistent market opportunities with schools. And by shortening that supply chain, some producers can even see an increased revenue from those sales. As farm to school procurement models grow and mature, we learn more and more about how farm to school can offer both economic and social benefits to farmers. And we'll hear more about that from our presenters today. Next slide, please, Hannah. So as we think about engaging farmers, it's important to consider why farm to school is important to those farmers and what gets them engaged and start and start getting involved with farm to school. Uh, in last year's National Farm to School Network Economic Impact of Farm to School study, that study included a survey of farmers, helping us understand what their motivations for getting engaged in farm to school were. In addition to that um, increased market opportunity, it, farmers also saw farm to school as an important opportunity to educate youth. And a lot of the time these initial relationships were initiated by schools or initiated by intermediaries that farmers were already selling from. So those can be great starting points for that engagement. In addition to understanding farmer motivations, there's also some great resources out there to help support farmers in taking some of these first steps. That includes a USDA fact sheet called Selling Local Foods to Schools, a resource for producers. And producers can even use the Farm to School Census website to identify potential school markets in their area. So in addition to engaging farmers in Farm to School, uh, there are a lot of, also a lot of resources to help support farmers in their expanding their Farm to School interests. So I'll put those links in uh, the chat box so you can all have access to those resources. And I'll turn it over to Hannah to get us started with our presentations for the day. Thank you, Lacey. Now we'll get started on finding out who our wonderful presenters are today. First off, we have Kristen McCartney. She is a registered dietitian uh, with a master's in public health. She has spent a majority of her career in obesity treatment and prevention efforts. She is a public health specialist for West Virginia University Extension and the director of the West Virginia SNAP-Ed program. We also have Emily Murphy, who is an obesity prevention specialist and associate professor with West, Western, uh, Western Virginia University Extension Service. By trade, she is a pediatric exercise uh, psychiatrist and has been conducting research in the realm of childhood obesity and prevention for over 15 years. Oops. Next, we have Summer uh, Sibley Brown. She is a community foods system development advocate and the founder and executive director of the Virginia, or I'm sorry, Virgin Islands Good Food Coalition. Uh, the coalition works to raise awareness about the importance and impact of a healthy local food system in the United States, Virgin Islands. We also have Nate Olive, who is the director of Ridge to Reef Farm in St. Croix, United States, Virgin Islands. His dual goal is to reverse the trend of food import dependency for the uh, territory while promoting ecologically regenerative agricultural practices. Next, we have 
uh, Megan Shedd. She is a specialist in early care and K through 12 education with the Center for Regional Food Systems in Michigan State University, with degrees in diet, dietics, uh, community service, and educational psychology. She has 20 years of experience in early childhood. Uh, working in public health, extension, and higher education. And lastly, we have Mary Brower. Along with her family, uh, she owns the Blue Stem Farm, a year-round organic farm that offers winter and summer farm memberships or CSA shares. And now we'll get started with our first presenters. All right, thank you um, for having us. We're honored to be on this webinar. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Next slide. So what's coming up right now is a video that's going to show you visually what our kids market program looks like. We figured if a picture is worth a thousand words, then a video is worth a million. So, um, the Kids Market program is something that was started in McDowell County, West Virginia as a pilot, and we've been able to expand statewide over the past year. And this video was recorded by one of our partners, the Food and Farm Coalition, to help us raise more funding for the program. So, enjoy. Well, I'm glad to know I'm not the only one who has technical issues when I do webinars or go to meetings, but um, hopefully even without the sound, you could kind of get a visual idea of what a kid's market looks like. Um, as you probably saw in the video, um, kids are able to shop using vouchers we've provided them, um, funded through different programs. Um, they receive recipes, they can try things, and, and overall it's a very interactive environment. Next slide. Our apologies, everyone, for that little technical error. Hannah, are you able to move to the next slide? Is this the slide that you, are you guys seeing a slide with a young girl smiling? We are not. Hmm. One moment, please. I'll go ahead and keep talking. So um, we do have a couple of farmers here that are gonna talk about the program as well. Um, Lisa DeMar is with the Garden Path, so I wanted to put that out there, but um, we're gonna save some time for them at the end. Um, just a little background on our program. I'm the director of SNAP-Ed in West Virginia, and SNAP-Ed is a program funded through the USDA 
in each state. So if you're a farmer or a nonprofit organization or someone else on the webinar looking to partner with someone, this is um, a great organization to partner with in your state. Um, in West Virginia, our primary goal is to improve nutrition and prevent obesity in limited income audiences. Um, we have 24 educators throughout the state that help provide this support. Um, they do classes, so direct education, and also what we call at SNAP-Ed policy systems and environmental change. So that includes creating places where people can access locally grown produce, um, such as a kid's market or just your standard farmer's market. Um, so, so we are statewide with that program, and we really focus a lot on fruit and vegetable consumption. It's something in our state that many people are lacking in, and um, so we focus not only on improving consumption, but also improving access. And I'll let Emily talk about the CDC project. I'm Emily Murphy, and I'm the, a PI on a project in West Virginia called the West Virginia Healthy Children Project that is funded through the CDC. Um, we are one of 12 states that receive funding through extension to do um, community-based programming. We happen to be the only state out of those 12 that um, elected to work with early child care and education settings. Um, and I would encourage if there's ever an RFA for other people to um, to submit. Um, we've, we've had a really great success with the, the project in general, but especially our farm to ECE component. Um, and basically with that, uh, we've been working with Kristen and the SNAP-Ed program to do some pop-up markets at our um, pre-K and Head Start um, facilities. And then this year, we were able to provide CSA boxes to our child care centers, as well as families attending those child care centers. Um, but one of the really neat things about, about being able to do that was working with the farmers in our three rural communities that this, this grant served. Um, and this was, for some of those farmers, that was the first time that they had ever provided CSA boxes to anyone. Um, and so this is something that they plan to continue in their communities um, in, in future years, even when the, the grant funding ends. Okay, next slide. So this is a, um, the state of West Virginia, in case you're not familiar. Um, so just over the last year, like I mentioned, we took the program statewide, um, combining the funding available through SNAP-Ed and the infrastructure we have with Extension and some funding from the I Foundation of America, which is a nonprofit. We were able to get $20,000 from the I Foundation of America. And with that, we served 5,400 um, kids across the state. The counties in blue are counties that had markets. The ones in yellow were CDC funded markets. Um, and you can see the distribution of where those markets were held. Um, we had 56 total markets um, that were in child care centers, at community events. Um, some were actually at existing farmers markets, health centers, schools, and a summer feeding site. And then also CSA boxes were provided in two of those counties for a total of 87 families. Next slide. So um, a big part of SNAP-Ed and, and most university outreach is, is evaluation. So we did that to see if the program was having an impact. And really what we want to see is that the kids are eating what they're buying. And also a big part of developing preferences for foods is having positive experiences around those things, becoming more familiar with them, being able to identify them. So you can see from the results, the market was able to impact um, kids' perceptions of fruits and vegetables um, to a high degree. And, and again, most of these were one-time events. So um, we were able to get that feedback from the parents. Next slide. So these are a couple of quotes that came from the parent surveys and you can read those and, and look at these beautiful kids with their produce. Um, so really, again, the impact of getting kids um, ha having more positive attitudes about fruits and vegetables not only helps them, you know, with their health and in the in the current time, but we're hoping they grow up to be future consumers as well. Next slide. 
We also got some feedback from the farmers because we want to make sure this is a program that's working for them and something we can sustain. Um, so you can see from this um, some of the quotes that they provided in terms of benefits, barriers, and unanticipated benefits. Um, we saw a lot of that even with uh, markets that we had held at schools, the cook saying the kids were eating more of their salad bar. So there were a lot of um, outcomes we didn't anticipate, which is nice. Um, and you can see from the results as far as their interest in continuing to host markets, a majority, 61%, were interested in hosting markets at schools, 56% at child care centers. Um, there was a lot of interest in working with schools on gardening. Um, and, and really a lot of interest in the CSA model, which I think has to do with the time commitment of the farmer. And if you can see from the barriers, you know, setting up a full market event at a school takes a lot of hauling of tables and different um, things. So a CSA model would be a little more nimble um, and would provide more flexibility to the farmers. So um, next slide. So here's some next steps that we're, we're considering, um, you know, more CSA type models. We want to integrate kids coupons as a financial incentive um, with EBT purchases. So this would be if, if someone would come to a market using their EBT card, um, they would be able to double their purchase. But if they had their children with them, those children would also get vouchers that only they could use to pick out what they wanted. Um, so again, to encourage, you know, the market as a family place and also um, reach out to those low income shoppers, um, looking at ways to make a stop and drop for farmers. So you can see the picture of kind of a display and, and the bins, you know, if we could set up something like that in a school that could be used on a weekly basis, it would facilitate maybe a little um, easier process for farmers. But speaking of farmers, I'm going to pass it over to my farmer, Lisa, who's going to talk about the impact of this program um, for their county. Next slide. Thanks, Kristen. Um, the pictures that you see there are pictures from uh, several of the markets that we supported. And when I say we, there was a group of approximately five farmers that consistently supported both one CDC market and three SNAP Ed markets um, up in our neck of the woods in the northern part of West Virginia. Um, one of the things I think that's really critical to point out from a farming perspective is that um, even experienced farmers or gardeners who will either provide a lot of produce to their families and friends or sell at a farmer's market, to really anticipate um, a schedule to have to deliver to is, is a pretty critical thing. And it's a, it's a concept that um, while we all plan and schedule, um, when you supply to families and farms and friends and and even the farmers markets, you are pretty flexible on a week to week basis to bring whatever you have ready. Um, if you're going to do something that's more of a CSA model or um, a school model, it's a definite big volume. So I think one of the points I'd like to share with those of you who are planning um, and working with farmers is, and it's not always in line with the grant cycle money, but um, people have to plan to get the volumes up. And for us last year, it was just a great opportunity to challenge ourselves a bit without having an opportunity to plan. But it was very, um, we were really lucky. Last year at the end of the fall, we had a really wonderful, long, warm fall season. And so the crops lasted much longer. And the opportunity did come up at a time when the attendance at our local farmers markets tends to drop off which is at the end of the season. Once the kids go back to school, the afternoon farmers markets um, are just not as well attended. So um, something to think about from that perspective. Um, one of the things, um, another thing with regard to that is um, it's for all of us, it was a real confidence builder that we could actually pull something like this off at first when we were approached and we started talking about, I don't know if we can do this. I don't think we can get enough. And, and luckily working with Kristen and the others um, within the program, they were very flexible um, and said, you know, bring what you can. <laughs> we want locally grown produce. And so it worked out really wonderful in, in building our, our confidence level and to actually go and be there with the kids. It's so different than being at a farmer's market where you drop the produce off at, uh, at the pictures on the left, the top two. 
are where we were at the uh, the daycare center. And just the kids, when you bring in the boatloads of produce, which was literally a truckload every week, um, they were so excited. They wanted to know what things were. They didn't know what a lot of the different kinds of produce um, things were. They didn't know what an eggplant was. And so um, the people at the actual daycare center learned as well as the kids and we always dropped off early in the morning so the parents were bringing the kids in at the same time so there was a lot of opportunity to really talk with the parents and the kids and the the people doing the education so that was a real positive impact um, because of this effort that we did at the end of last year um, this group of farmers is now working collaboratively and we just um, found out this week that we got funding to support 25 families in, um, in, in Wetzel County um, through the Health Right program. And so they will be, um, will be doing that for 20 weeks this, this year. Um, and then again, working with the, with the school systems. So we're, we're just thrilled about that. The, the level of capacity that the farmers are increasing their production is three to four times what we've grown in past years. So it's, it's just everyone's um, really excited and pumped up to do this. And it's just a, a very, very rewarding experience. Um, I, think that, I think that covers about everything that I needed to cover. Thanks, Lisa. I think what we'd want to leave people with is we see the kids market as a way to build future consumers, engage families and communities, but really building capacity um, with our producers who in West Virginia, most are very small producers. Um, so this is a great way to give them kind of a no risk um, market opportunity to, like Lisa said, build confidence, build connections, and then um, you know strengthen those through continued grants and, and opportunities. So um, that's really the key with this market. It's a great, um, great way to start small, but then grow. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, sorry about that little tidbit at the beginning without the video not working, but we will send everyone a link of that video in the follow-up email. And now we're gonna hear from Summer and Nate uh, from Virgin Islands Good Food Coalition. Summer and Nate, we're not hearing you yet. You may need to unmute. Hello, I'm here. This is Nate. Can you hear me? We can hear you, Nate. All right, Summer, looks like we yes. should have you ready to go as well. Can you? Okay. Hi. Great. Yes, now. Yeah. Perfect. Hi, good day, everyone. I am Summer Sibley Brown. And um, I live in the Virgin Islands. And we started off basically our farm to school movement while I worked as a school teacher. Um, and so the perspective of our slides is how do, you, how do you engage farmers when you really don't know much about farming? Next slide. So the next slide coming up is my teaser slide because I live here, right? And I have access to all this beauty. But when we move to the next slide, I'd like to um, propose that we also have some challenges because we are also divided by water. So when you look at um, an 84 square mile island, a 34 square mile island and a 10 square mile island that is trying to build a farm to school program in paradise, what problems could we possibly have? Well, we have a 98% import rate. We have poor distribution infrastructure. Our three islands have three cultures and also our farmers are separated by water. So um, building momentum becomes um, difficult, keeping that momentum up in the community. When you live on one island and there's two other islands that you're trying to get to, that's pretty difficult as well. Um, we've also seen issues in building trust in the farm, farming community and looking at a major component for us was equity and access. How do we get this food to all people and how do we get all farmers involved? Next slide. So the question is, at the time I was a school teacher and where did I begin? I began with just talking to people. Um, I went out into the community. This 
program was spearheaded by 14 students who had a desire to bring farm to school to the Virgin Islands. And so we started with talking, um, really just with no information, talking to, to 10 different farmers, um, trying to figure out if they were interested, if they had heard about farm to school, what did they know? Um, how could we kind of work together? Um, was where we started. Next slide. And a lot of our farmers um, were really very, very hesitant. They were like, farm to school, what's that? Um, I got a lot of negative responses in the beginning that it couldn't work, it wouldn't work, that this program could work in places that look different than us. But because of some of the previous challenges I mentioned, the 98% import our separated island structure that building a territorial farm to school program would be really challenging and so that lesson took me to wanting to first build awareness in the community um, on what farm to school was um, next slide please so we started with just information um, Nate, who is also a farmer, and he has been my partner in the farm to school movement and building the farm to school movement in the Virgin Islands, he was one of the initial farmers whom I had this conversation with and probably the only farmer whose outlook was like, I'm a farmer, I want to grow food, and I want to get that food to people who it matters to. So if you're serious, I'm serious. That journey took us about three years um, to get food into schools, but we started with information. So I did um, farm to school meet and greets. I worked with the Department of Agriculture and we had a marketing expansion conference that focused um, in large part on what the farm to school opportunity could be. Um, we had town hall meetings and at those meetings, I also gathered farmer data. Where are you? What size is your farm? What are you growing? because while I was giving the community information, as a novice, I was also collecting information for myself on what our farming community was. Um, that picture that you see there is a picture of the first agricultural and marketing expansion conference. Um, and we had about 100 farmers in the room. So we knew that getting the information out there had piqued some interest. Next slide, please. Then after the information started bubbling, um, it was time to revisit those, hello? It was time to revisit those conversations. And I think I had learned my lesson just so I made those conversations a little bit more formal. We did interviews, had small focus groups and really um, took time to build trust really help farmers understand that I actually didn't want anything but to figure out how we could work together to make farm to school happen. And the trust building piece, I think was the longest piece of the work, just making sure you were consistent, that you were present, that your message was consistent um, and that, that they had access to you. Next slide. From there, um, we applied for a farm to school grant and we use that farm to school grant as a larger piece of our education opportunity. So the workshop focused on, it was a two day conference sponsored by USDA. It was called Linking the Chain and we had educators, producers, parents and policymakers come together for two days. Um, and really the focus was helping them figure out the different pieces of farm to school and what that could look like. For the farmers, we focused on procurement. We focused on how you could um, volunteer at a school. We had different persons from the mainland come in. We had Doug Davis from Vermont feature the Vermont's farm to school program. We had someone from the Colorado farm to school program come and really speak to our farmers about the market opportunity and kind of what it looked like in different places. Next slide. Then from there, um, I sat in a room with farmers, policymakers, educators, and figured out this is a strategic room at what would we need to do to make farm to school possible? And this is critical because the farmer input is um, the middle orange piece that talks a lot about what the challenges to producers in this area would be and what we would actually need to do 
to get from point A to B, where Farm to School would be a viable program for the territory, but what producers would need to succeed. And as you can see, there's a lot of things that were missing in our infrastructure to support our producers. But that was the opportunity to really gather information from the producers and lean in on their expertise. Next slide, please. The, we then, we, to keep the momentum going once we started getting things done, um, the motivation of farmers in the community seeing us be successful was really, really helpful. So when we got our first watermelons into the school, and um, when we got our first lettuce, I remember um, when Nate got his first farm to school product into the school, there was a big write up in the paper that piqued farmers interest because now the thing that they thought was impossible they started seeing as possible. And so at every opportunity, whether it's social media, local newspaper, in the news, just really pushing your successes out there so that they could see that the program was building and that it was um, real and it was tangible. It just wasn't talk because we were coming from a place where we had no farm to school activity. And like I said in the beginning, farmers were very, very hesitant. Um, the picture on the right shows um, a farmer's meet and greet we had for the first time we celebrated um, our farm to school month where we gave all our local farmers an opportunity to celebrate themselves, celebrate the work that they did, call them up, have the community see who they were. And I think there was a lot of pride in knowing that these people were already participating or preparing to participate in the farm to school program and that generated more buzz. Next slide, please. So if we were smart, I was starting out not knowing anything. I didn't, I had no idea what public engagement was um, and, I, and I didn't think it through. And um, as I was putting together this PowerPoint, I found this public engagement continue, continuum on bangthetable.com and I was like, ah, oh, this is what I did. I mean, there's, so there's two sides of the spectrum. I informed, I consulted, I involved, I collaborated and I empowered farmers to kind of own this. Um, I think Ridge to Reef Farm is the perfect example of the empowerment model because as we learn together, um, Nate really took step up, he took the challenge on and he has been like the constant partner and second voice in advocating, but that also taking action for farm to school to happen in the Virgin Islands. And so now, now that I know um, <laughs> this public engagement model exists, this is what I'm going to use to kind of help evaluate and plan how we continue to engage farmers. Um, next slide. And so the lessons that I learned is that um, engaging farmers is a trust building process. Um, you should lean in on your farming community's knowledge. They know a lot, they can help you figure out a lot um, and it helps them bec become empowered to own farm to school. Be aware of your farming community dynamics because every place has their own dynamic and you shouldn't just push in on what is already existing, but really you wanna like grow out of it. Easy access to information. Farmers are going to have questions. They're gonna wanna know how things work. They're gonna need time to process it and it should be you know, at their fingertips. Identify clear roles. Who's the farm to school coordinator? Who's the person coordinating um, volunteering at your school? Who's the person coordinating procurement? Who do I talk to if I want to get something into a, for example, a youth CSA? Make those persons easily identifiable. Have a place for them to receive technical assistance and training. Keep the dialogue going. In the beginning, they'll need it, and that's part of the trust building process. Um, establish points of contact, especially within the department, because maybe your department doesn't have a farm to school state person, but whoever the person who the advocate, the nonprofit, the program is working with, the farmers need to know that so they can get questions answered. And lastly, ensure that they understand the procurement and payment process and that your agency also understands the procurement and payment process. Because in the beginning for small farms and new farmers who want to access this market, a large part of what they need is to ensure that they know it takes 30 days, 50 days, 10 days, whatever your payment schedule is. So when they deliver a crop, that's met. I'm gonna pass it over to Nate. Hello everyone, good afternoon. 
Um, yeah, thank you, Summer, and thank you all for having me here. Um, we are, I mean, with Ridge to Farm, and uh, as Summer is saying, uh, we've we've been trying to uh, make this a reality in the Virgin Islands, and there's a lot of just geographic challenges. Um, I'm originally from Georgia, and I'm aware of the farming scene there. It's a whole different scene. Uh, one of the things as a farmer is uh, earlier I heard it talk about the volume and the scheduling matching the menus and how much you need to hit the whole district with the same uh, meal every day and uh, that's that's one of our biggest challenges meeting the volume and the timing uh, along with our partners in the school system and uh, some misses uh, I feel like we've grown a lot and we've learned a whole lot and um, you know our stance as farmers is tell us four months ahead of time what, what you want and we'll get it to you and um, so we're trying to do that trying to get to that stage where we can really be planning ahead all the time uh, but you know you get things like the hurricane that we had in September or both hurricanes and uh, some of you know we didn't have the full complement of crops so far but as you see in the slide uh, if you're on the Ridge Tree Farm to School Hub slide I can't see the presentation um, but that's uh, Tropics Hydroponics. It's one of the farms that we work with. We work with about 12 farms aggregating crops, pumpkins, lettuce, tomato, cucumber, a bunch of other things, about 10 other items, and um, get them into the schools. And um, it can be challenging. You know, we're a small farm. We're not, you know, decked out with tons of uh, finances or delivery equipment or all that, but uh, we, you know, are making it happen, and our community is very supportive of it here. Um, we've been shipping things, uh, not just to the schools here in St. Croix, but also to St. Thomas, the other island, uh, which is connected to St. John. And uh, so, like, you know, a few weeks ago, we had lettuce going over on a small airplane because the boats weren't, these were rough. And the, the airplane guy, he had a box, cases of lettuce sitting in the passenger seat buckled in next to him. It was so full <clears throat> to get it over there. So we really have to be, uh, what my dad says, uh, use island ingenuity to make things happen. And um, down here, uh, we're small scale. As a farm, it's difficult because we don't have a big secondary market to quote unquote dump our products. If we don't make this sale, then we don't have another big comparable market. And so that's been one of our biggest challenges um, here. And um, production wise, you know, we're able to grow a lot of crops year round. Um, so, you know, I feel like once we get all the wheels turning, we can be a great example of year round farm to school production with a wide variety of, of crops, of colors, of nutrition, and, and a growing number of farms. And one of the things that we do as a hub but Summer mentioned the payment schedules is uh, we have a CSA program at our farm, which we have been doing for years, and we still run the CSA program. It gives our farm like some upfront money, which we then turn around and we're able to pay other farmers on the spot when we, when we pick up their aggregated contribution to that day's delivery. So that, that means that that farmer can go that day and buy food for his family and we can get the crops to the schools and our CSA members get their crops and the kids get fed. So that's the model that we're working with here. And um, anyway, we're, we're growing as we move along. So um, thank you all for the opportunity to speak and um, best of luck to all of your projects. And as we close out, I just wanna say the one thing that I've learned um, is this is really all about relationships, like building strong relationships is what gets local food into schools and on kids' plates. Thank you. Thank you both so much for taking the time to speak with us today. Uh, next, we'll move on to uh, Megan and Mary from Michigan. Uh, and also, don't forget that if you have any questions, to go ahead and put them in the question box now. And as we get to the end of the presentation, we'll be able to start answering those questions. Um, and we will have ample time to answer questions, so um, make sure you put those in there as soon as you as soon as they pop into your head. Uh, whenever you guys are ready, you can go ahead and get started. Thanks. And Summer provided a really helpful segue about the the building of relationships. Um, so if you want to flip to the next slide, 
you can see the Center for Regional Food Systems here at Michigan State University. That's really what the center is all about, is building those relationships and bringing people together. Um, you can go ahead, you can see the different networks that we bring together as far as the food hubs, the farm to institution network, local food councils, and the meat network. And really what, what we do is we have a, this good food charter that brings together and envisions this thriving economy, equity and sustainability for Michigan and all of the people through a food system that's really rooted in local communities, but it's centered on good food. Next slide, please. The idea of the Good Food Charter is that by the year 2020, we can meet or exceed, um, and there, there are different goals that are underneath that. But one of the biggest ones and what really um, is relevant here is that within our um, school systems, 20% of food products would be from Michigan growers, producers, and processors. So unlike the Virgin Islands, we're looking, well, I'm looking out my window and seeing snow right now. So we don't have the same year-round growing system that we see in um, either the local part of the, or, sorry, the lower part of the nation or in the Virgin Islands, which is a little sad when it's the first of March. Um, but we do want to see our Michigan farmers um, having a, a profitable supply from at least 20% of Michigan institutions, retailers, consumer food purchases, but we also want them to be able to pay fee, fair wages to their workers. Um, we're looking at 80% of Michigan residents, which is twice the current level, having easy access to affordable, fresh, healthy food, and 20% of that as part of this food charter should be coming from Michigan sources. We also have Michigan nutrition standards, and part of this food charter is that 100% of school meals and 75% of schools should be selling food that are within their school meal program. So that's really what this food charter is all about. And we want to see food and agriculture and the pre-K through 12th grade curriculum for all Michigan students and youth having access to food and agriculture entrepreneurial opportunities. So if you flip to the next slide for us, um, we're really looking at promoting policy changes that advance good food in Michigan. So you can see these different pieces of the that earlier slide coming together. Um, but the idea is that good food is both healthy, it's green, it's fair, and it's affordable. So all people are having access to food. And that's really where um, Who Passes for Health was coming in. But there's a context that is perhaps important to look at before we get into Who Passes for Health. So next slide. And I know what Mary's gonna talk about is way more interesting. So I'm trying to get through the, the background piece. So we started with the Michigan Farm to School um, as part of this overarching program. And you can't really talk about farm to school and who passes for health. They can be separate, but really they're, they're complementary. So the goal of Michigan Farm to School is to increase the number, but also expand the breadth of farm to school programs in Michigan, of which farm to early care and education is a big part. We wanted to see an increase in the um, vulnerable children's access to healthy food, but also their awareness of food that's local and fresh and healthy. And that's taking place within schools or districts, but also early childhood edu education programs. And this is really building on that first component of the Good Food Charter, or this idea that Michigan institutions would source 20% of their food program food products, sorry, from Michigan growers, producers, and processors. The Hoop Houses for Health program, this is a, a grant, and the idea is that it would increase good food for vulnerable families, but also at the same time expand the good food infrastructure and season extension capacity of Michigan. So you can imagine our growing season is, it, it's not all that long. So the idea is that Hoop Houses for Health is providing loans to farmers to build hoop houses, and extend their growing season. And they're paying those off by forming farm to school partnerships and providing food directly to schools or and or early childhood meal programs. So they have planning grants for this program and that helps them to develop a farm to school action plan to begin a program. And then the implementation grant helps the school actually put the plan into action and then develop a sustainability plan to keep the program going beyond the scope of this three year program. So while farm to school can be a combination of early care and K-12 programs, who passes for health does the exact same thing. So they work in partnership in terms of um, imp implementing or getting early care and education programs, a farm to school and early care to education programs, getting access to food, but also keeping that food in the programs and giving some access to who passes for farmers as well. So next slide. I think we have a little, yeah, a little bit of a lag time. So farmers apply to the Michigan Farmers Market Association, or you'll hear it referred to as MIFMA, to build a new hoop house. Then they receive a loan for the hoop house 
and pay it back through produce sold either at a participating farmer's market or through that farm to school relationship that we just talked about. So those are two different ways. So MIFMA can help them work with a community partner organization to distribute vouchers to vulnerable families or here at the Center for Regional Food System, we can connect them, um, connect the farmer to schools or an early care and education site, and they will provide produce to the school or the early care and education site in exchange for credit to their loan. So the families can use the voucher to buy produce from the participating who passes for health farmer at a local farmer's market, or they are providing produce directly to the school or early care and education site and paying off the loan that way. So there's a voucher system going back and forth. And so the photos there, one is the Hoop House at one of our farmers, or there's a farmer's market, and you can see where they're accepting the voucher for the Hoop Houses for Health program. Next slide. And so to date, we've had 22 sites of early care and education sites participating, and these include Head Start, Great Start Readiness Program, private and family or in-home providers, and 25 schools or school districts. So we're looking at a total of 84 sites that have identified as participating, so 47 early care and education sites, or 37 community partners. So a distribution partner might be a community action board or a community action agency, or a community liaison like county extension or a health department office. And so you can see the difference in distribution as far as how families or early care and education providers or schools might be um, distributing vouchers. Next slide. And we recently had an independent evaluation of the program to find out how this is working. So is it working for educators and is it working for um, those who are actually getting the coupons or getting the produce? And so why were educators participating? And really there was a huge desire Providers want to know what's being fed to the children in their care, but they also want to keep money in the local community. So this is a benefit for not only the food that's being fed to the children, but they want to keep local farmers in business too. They have a preference to cook from scratch, but also see that connection, a curricular connection really, to connect fresh food, nutritional issues. They're thinking about food allergies, the quality of the food. Um, several of them talked about taste, but also competitive prices. So we have local grocery store chains here. They knew that their farmers were competitive in terms of prices. And so one of them described as, I'm keeping it in house. And so developing those relationships with farmers was also really important to them as well. Next slide. So when they talk about how they're beginning their purchasing or getting those relationships started with farmers, um, many of them talked about challenges as far as, like, well, where do I get this? How do I set up a relationship with a, a farmer as far as who passes for health? And most of them started by actually visiting their farmer's market and just chatting up their farmers. And farmers were really open to this idea. Like if they had a who passes for health voucher sign on the front, they would start talking with early care and education provider. And a lot of them just started talking on their own, which I think is fascinating. Um, some of our early care and education sites or the schools would then go through the training with the Center for Regional Food Systems, um, and some of them would conduct their own research and reach out to farmers and find out, well, this is the product that I have available. Um, I like that Nate said, you let me know what you need four months in advance and I'll work it out for you, and that's what was happening here in Michigan too. So they would say, this is what I want. You know, I want greens, I want tomatoes, I need this, and so they would find out what's available. They would figure out how to place orders or make payments, and so we would walk them through that. But a lot of the early care and education providers were doing that on their own. And certainly that was taking place in schools where we have larger enrollments and they need to figure out well in advance or they were doing cyclical menus and needed to figure that out well in advance. They were also talking about delivery options and associated costs. So while the Virgin Islands has a plane with lettuce in the front seat, we're having um, principals or food service directors that are picking produce up in their trucks or in their family vehicles. So they would go to a farmer's market on a Saturday and make the, that um, make that pickup on their own or they're working with a farmer to have a, relative, a re regular delivery. Um, and so these practices become our success stories as far as how they're partnering to make sure that they have the things that they need. Next slide. And when we're talking about these success stories, and this is what feels really important from um, an educator perspective, but also a food service and a farmer perspective, we're seeing that um, reduction in food waste. 
So children are eating more of the locally grown, locally produced food, um, and it's a reduction in food waste. So less produce is being thrown into the trash because they're getting to know the farmers as well, especially when the farmer is the one dropping off that particular produce and the food service directors and food service workers. And in the case of the family care provider, that's the person that's actually preparing the food. They have cost control. So they're more likely to be very strict in terms of what's being prepared and how it's being prepared. So we have less food waste. A lot of the providers talk about having a very um, close relationship with the farmer. And so if a farmer can't get a particular product to a provider, they work with the provider and let them know, or they work with the school, I can't get you this because you know we've had a particular weather issue, but I can provide you with this. And the hoop houses help to negate some of those weather issues, um, but they also will talk about, you know, we still have cold, we still have snow, so things, you know, a hoop house can still have some issues. Providers really like this idea of high quality product. And so they talk about that and they also talk about this idea of the goals that they have for increasing the other aspects of local food in their setting and also creating their own data sets as far as um, what they have in their program. Next slide. So with that, um, since the program began, and this is where um, Mary is going to start to talk in just a second because her stuff is way more interesting. We've had 80 loans total over the three years. 15 of them, those have been paid in full, but we have repeat loaners. So farmers have come back. While five farms have graduated from the program, we have farmers that will come back and they'll get additional loans. And that feels really important. So actually the program began in 2011. So that's seven years that it's since it's been um, since it since its inception. Next slide. So Mary, I'm gonna turn it over to you because your stuff is fascinating to me and I can't wait for everyone else to see the photos that you've provided too. Hey everybody. Um, I don't know what everybody's background is in our virtual room, but I want to kind of calibrate my part of this with two words I want you to focus on. I want you to think about money and I want you to think about winter. And I cannot emphasize enough. This is a place where it really is winter for seven months out of the year. And if you imagine walking into a grocery store, like a giant grocery store with like high ceilings and fluorescent light and aisles and aisles and aisles and aisles. And you walk into that grocery store and literally nothing in it has come from anywhere around here. We might as well be a Mars unit with piped in food in Northern Michigan. It's just really cold and impossible to grow things that are fresh throughout the year unless you take extraordinary measures. The second word, money. Look, like a lot of farmers, think about all the words, the adjectives that you associate with farmers. Poor farmer, dirt farmer, dumb farmer. Like farmers are not wealthy people. The farmers that we're talking about are, are often the working poor themselves. And so the beautiful thing about this Hoop Houses for Health program is that it takes these two very serious problems head on, money and winter, and sets them next to each other to fight each other like villains in a B movie so that, <laughs> so that good can prevail. And the good that we're talking about is triple. There's eating good food. There's the the value of um, extending the season in this cold, cold place, which has positive environmental impacts to start with, and the finances, the, the, the condition of the wealth of the farmers themselves. So we're taking on public health, we're taking on environmental concerns, and we're taking on the wealth of these farmers. And this lovely initiative, I, I truly hope that everybody who's a farmer out there can, um, can take away the idea that that this this nonprofit has has really resolved a couple of persistent problems in in our community for so many people so many parts of of Michigan um, by just uh, 
providing farmers with zero interest loans, and then trusting us to do the sorts of um, grassroots organization that Summer talked about doing um, in her community. So people, people can be trusted to take on the problems that they have, but not, not without the, the resources and support that they need to get that done. Farmers can be trusted to work hard to find, you know, uh, food service directors who are able to use a knife and a cutting board and willing to cut up butternut squash and prepare chicken from scratch. Um, but we can't do that if we're also supposed to provide the food that we grow at the sort of commodity prices that schools are able to get them at if they're, if they're buying potato buds that they shake out of a box at whatever cents a box, um, we can't compete with that. So what we're, uh, what we're able to do as a result of this initiative is um, be offered the chance to, to make those relationships, to solve those problems, and, and, and that opportunity wasn't there before the hoop houses and the loans. Um, can I have the next slide, please? I should have been talking, carrying forth with the image of the farm and the hoop house. So this is my family farm in Northern Michigan, and that's uh, me and my family. My husband's up front, my mother-in-law is in the red, and I'm carrying the baby, and my brother-in-law is, is the last in pulling the plastic on this hoop house. Um, a hoop house, if you're not familiar, is a, it's like a greenhouse, but it's not heated with electricity or wood or propane or anything. It's just a passive solar structure. And they can really do a lot if you select cold hardy crops to, um, to just shield against the effects of winter. And, and things can live in there throughout the winter um, as long as you harvest them when it's above freezing inside the hoop house. So it might be a, a zero degree day outside, but if the sun is shining bright, it might be 30 degrees inside depending on the weather conditions. So then you can harvest your spinach and you can put it in your minivan and go out to the school and deliver it to the food service director under those conditions. Well, the food that's grown in hoop houses, not just in winter, but also in summer too, are the high value crops. It's hard to grow things like melons or tomatoes or peppers up here in northern Michigan without some extra heat. The growing season isn't long enough and the summer days are just not typically hot enough to make those crops thrive. So a hoop house is a really, really valuable thing for making, um, just, just hedging our bets against the harshness of the weather up here. Um, but they're expensive things to, to get and lots of farms uh, have other things to spend $10,000 on besides one of these structures. So um, the, I think the last thing that I'll say is that as a direct result of Who Houses for Health, I've been in farming for about, in Northern Michigan, for about as long as Who Houses for Health has been in existence. And when I started my farm in 2012, um, there was one farm that had Who Houses. And now, I don't know, maybe there are eight. There are a number of us. Our winter market is awesome. I can eat green smoothies all winter long up here because people are growing greens in these, in these wonderful structures. So people are healthier for sure. And people are also richer for sure um, as a result of, of this really cool initiative. I'll close. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much. And Megan, did you have any closing things you wanted to say? No, oh, what else can you say after that? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. Um, we're going to go ahead and go to the questions slide and get started with some questions. Uh, we will have about 11 minutes to look at some of these questions. Um, the first one I'm going to ask is for uh, Michigan. Um, in the Michigan model, who is responsible for the delivery of the produce and other food products to schools and who bears the cost of distributing in terms of money, time, and labor? So Mary might be able to um, talk about what's happening up north, but it, it, it varies. Um, so depending on, and we have pockets of the Hoop Houses for Health program in different parts of the state. So Michigan's actually a fairly large state. So we have the Upper Peninsula and the Lower Peninsula, and we have Hoop Houses all over the place. Um, 
So it, it honestly depends. We have some farmers, some schools that are traveling. Usually the school, the larger the distance the, than the school or the early care and education setting is traveling. So the school or the, the provider is bearing that cost and they have to figure that into their budget. We do have some settings where they will um, collaborate and so they will work together to figure out how to um, to almost like a food hub distribution type setting or type situation and then they will figure that out um so it, it really does depend and mary i don't know if you want to talk about how you might be distributing up in the north where where travel is it, it's definitely more geographically diverse yeah i mean spaces are are far up here um i think everybody treats the the school uh contacts the Hoop House is for Health school relationships, just as any other. If I sell to a grocery store, I've got to drive my food to the grocery store. So it's just in my normal delivery rotation. And as far as I know, it's that way for my fellow farmers as well. Thank you. Um, the next question we're going to look at, we have um, someone who is a small farmer, a small scale urban farmer. Um, and they're wondering, is it possible to focus in on supplying one school instead of a whole district? For anyone. Hello. Uh, go ahead. This is Summer. Um, so I would think that's based on how your district is set up. And so one of the first things you might want to do is find out like if you have a state farm to school person and you can ask that, that, them that question. In the Virgin Islands, that's not possible because how we are set up is all our purchases have to go through the school food authority. But in some states, schools do, school, um, schools do procure their own food. In some districts, it works like that. So you would need to find out who your state person is and ask that ask them that question and that's how you know if you can focus on a school or do you need to supply for a district. Thank you, yes. And and like Summer said, if you want to ask, um, we have core partners in every state and if you hop on the NFSN website and find our partners and just send them an email and ask them specifically how your state works for that. Um, also, this is for Virgin Islands. How does the conversation start between farmer and school? And who is the person that usually starts that conversation? Well, in this case, um, it it's me. Um, in the past, in terms of when we were engaging farmers as like volunteers and to help us start school-based gardens, that was a school to farmer conversation. But for procurement, um, five years ago, I kind of started that charge. And so now most people have identified me as the farm to school contact. I'm also the core partner. So I'm on the website. And so like, they will go to a farmer and say, hey, I want to supply the farm to school. And they, say, well, they will say, well, you should call Summer Sibley. She'll be able to help you figure out what you need to do. Um, so that's like the really important part in establishing who can be your point of contact. Um, yes. Can I add something here? Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah, you need. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's one of those things like, um, you know, as, as a farm, I mean, we always thought it, it was a great idea, obviously, to supply the schools with our fresh organic crops. Um, but, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, we just kind of, you know, just keep trying to push for. There's just no traction because it's just this impossible system to get into. And uh, not until there, there was some of the changes that happened with the government. And then and then um, you know, it just kind of boiled up at the same time. And then, uh, you know, what, what was missing was summer was this champion, you know, who, who came up as a teacher just, in, you know, so interested in in this whole concept. And and that is really what made it work. And I think her just being, um, you know, really open to all the possibilities. And like she said, reaching out to people. Um, and then it was like, you know, like she said, I mean, to me personally, it was like, wow, this is really possible. Like we could really do this. And then when it got into the, you know, procurement stages, it was like, this was going to happen. And, um, you know, this kind of far flung idea all of a sudden became like a reality. And so I think that farmers, 
think it's a great idea and farmers are farmers not to make millions of bucks. Obviously we're there because we care about people and providing food. Most farmers, I would say. And so I think if you kind of reach out like she did, you probably will start finding like a lot of people who've been waiting for you to ask, you know, that's my feedback. Thank you, Nate. Um, also the next question is, for West Virginia for the program. I think this is a clarification question for the program where the kids have uh, coupons or, or stipends to buy fresh produce. Um, did, you say, did you say that the produce is, uh, the farmers were able to get $20,000 over one visit with all the kids or was this over multiple visits over a period of time? So the way it worked is we gave each child participating at the site $4. Um, so, and we, we covered a total of 30 counties. So depending on what the site was and how many kids, that's how much money the farmers got. So I'm not great at math, but let's say there were 500 kids at the site and they each got $4 and the farmer would make $2,000. So, um, so the, the benefit there was if we could get a farmer to show up, we could tell them exactly how much money they were going to make for that day based on how many kids we were going to serve and knowing that we were giving them each $4 vouchers. Um, and I think the important part is that, you know, we were able to run it through our existing infrastructure through SNAP-Ed and the CDC grant. So we weren't taking any like administrative cost out of that. So every dollar from the vouchers went straight back to the farmers. And I would add to that also by saying that when we set up as farmers at the schools that teachers and some parents that were there supervising the kids um, and they were actually calling friends out in the community <laughs> to say, hey, there's a farmer's market at the school. So there was some opportunity for additional cash sales at the at the school market as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, also, we have a question about the way that you guys were able to fund that. Could you talk about that for a minute? Sure. Um, so so the, these, the vouchers were funded um, for this year from the I Foundation of America. That's what funded the $20,000. And then Emily mentioned she had CDC funding, obviously, which is a larger um, federal grant. But um, since the I Foundation funding We've um, encouraged our educators who are in their counties to just look for small community grants. So pretty much every county has some sort of foundation, um, you know, that accepts grants on a yearly or, or twice yearly basis. Um, and again, I mean, this is a small start, but if you're giving each child $4, you can really scale it however you want. If you want to ask for $1,000 and just serve a small amount of kids, you know, really, you can start small and try it out with a small amount of funding and kind of go from there. Thank you. Um, and now we're going to go for one last question. Uh, and this is for the farmers. Um, people are wondering what is the best way for schools and other organizations to reach out to farmers to get involved with Farm to School? This is Mary, I'll start. Um, a lot of farmers who are scaled up to the sort of size that could serve a large kitchen, like a, like a school, will have um, a wholesale price list. And so one thing to do would be to walk up and down the farmer's market and ask if people have wholesale price lists or if they're, if they're, if they're wanting to sell to a kitchen. Um, another nonprofit in my area set up kind of a, a farmer uh, buyer meet and greet for institutions and um, like hospitals and schools. And so setting up some kind of speed dating thing for farmers and buyers um, can be a good thing to do too. And, and I'd, I'd like to add that um, you know, as a farmer, um, you know, the work is never done on a farm and I'm tied to my farm. It's really hard to leave. And, um, you know, it, I think going to the farm on their turf and, and um, you know, or a market, because that's, you know, where the farmer's going to be. I, I think what you just said was great. Um, and, uh, but, but, you know, like, like, you know, really meeting the farmer on their, on their ground and their, 
level and, and all that is, is super important. And, um, um, yeah, just, just be personal and just real people. A lot of, a lot of these farms are family farms and, and, uh, I think the personal touch and, and getting out on the property if possible, um, or whatever they kind of offer as a way for people to visit or see their farms is, is a really good approach. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of our presenters today. Uh, it is at time for us to finish up this webinar. And so for all of you who have been able to stick with us, we wanted to let you know that tomorrow or Monday of next week, you will be receiving a follow-up email with the recording to this webinar, as well as any resources that we shared or that any of the resources that the presenters shared, you will have links to those as well. Thank you so much for joining us on today's webinar.